Okay. Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, to the Azim Premji University Colloquium series. Uh, today, we have a talk on uh, Towards Health Equity in India, Operationalizing a Rights-Based Approach by uh, Professor Abhijit Das. Uh, very short introduction to uh, Abhijit. Uh, he is the founder and managing trustee of the Center for Health and Social Justice uh, in New Delhi and clinical associate professor in the Department of Global Health at the University of Washington uh, in Seattle. Uh, he's a medical doctor by training. Abhijit has over 30 years of work on health governance and citizens participation and men and gender equality. He has fostered uh, South to South learning uh, through networks like uh, COPASA and uh, Men Engage Global Alliance. Uh, he has served as an expert on various policy bodies in India, including the Ministry of Health, the Planning Commission, the National Human Rights Commission, and UN Women. Uh, he's on the advisory board of several academic centers in different universities across the world and has been invited as a speaker to several international conferences, including the UN and the EU, on issues related uh, to maternal uh, health, family planning, HIV AIDS, gender and masculinity. Uh, it's a great privilege to have uh, Abhijit here with us today and I will uh, invite him now to give his talk, Abhijit. Thank you. Thank you, Shilata. Thank you uh, very much for this invitation that uh, a APU has uh, given me. Uh, it's an excellent opportunity to interact with uh, young minds and uh, try to share some of the experiences that uh, I have had over the years in working in the field of uh, public health. So uh, without further ado, let me uh, come to my presentation and um, I hope it works without a hitch. So is that visible? Is that visible? Um, I'm assuming I am uh, visible uh, and audible. Uh, so uh, as I said, my presentation is going to be on towards health equity in India. And it's going to be based on some very, very uh, sort of personal experiences, but I will try to extrapolate into uh, what does it mean in terms of systems. So uh, before I start, I'd like to uh, share a few words about myself. And uh, as you can see, I am male. Uh, I come from a educated middle class uh, and upper so social caste background. And my sort of religious background is uh, religious reform, which is a, a Brahmo, uh, a kind of, sort of reform movement that started in Bengal in the mid uh, 19th century. And my family has its roots uh, three generations ago in a country which is now known as Bangladesh. And I'm saying all this because I want to locate myself also personally in the kind of work that we do. And I think that helps us to gain insight into the uh, sort of what we see, what we experience and what we learn. Uh, another word about myself is my father died when I was 10 years ago, 10, 10 years old, and I was raised by women, um, mother and uh, both my grandmothers, aunts, uh, etc. Uh, because my father died very young, uh, I had to complete schooling through a scholarship as a, as a so-called socially, uh, economically backward, but uh, we did have, because of family connections, access to one of the best schools in Calcutta. So I did receive a good education, even though, uh, because of my family privileges, even though we were at that point not economically very well off. I trained as a doctor and I worked in a rural Uttar Pradesh as a community doctor and uh, obstetrician for about 14 years. And uh, in the last 21 years since then, I've been working more on public policy. I trained in public health and I've been more uh, working more on public policy and programming. But in many ways, the first 14 years that I spent in rural India is actually the uh, forms the basis and the sort of uh, inspiration and the women of uh, rural India actually form the both the anchor and uh, the inspiration for my work. So. 
as I worked in uh, rural uh, UP mostly and what is Uttarakhand now, uh, there were certain foundational experiences which shaped the way that my future career, the last 20 years or so, have been um, framed. Mm, these are some of the experiences that I want to share with you. One is the experience of a girl who came in with both typhoid and pneumonia. Uh, typhoid pneumonia was a kind of common parlance that people used in, in rural uh, Uttarakhand, uh, Uttar, Uttar Pradesh at that time, and said, used to say that this person has typhoid pneumonia. As a doctor, I used to say, how is that possible? Typhoid uh, disease of the uh, uh, gastrointestinal system, pneumonia disease of the um, respiratory system, how, do, how can they coexist? And here was this woman, a very young woman who came with what I found was both these conditions and, and I was perplexed. And then I went into her story and she was first surprised that I didn't know her. And it came out that she was this girl of 16 who had recently married. She was looking like a woman, but I had seen her earlier as a girl because I had gone to her house. And what I learned was she had just been married. And after marriage, she had to spend her first menstrual period, which was winter, in the cow shed. And then I realized that in this part of the world or in that part of the country, there were a huge range of menstrual taboos that women had to go through. And this was something that I hadn't learned at all in Calcutta, where I had trained as a house surgeon in the department of gynae and obs in Calcutta's biggest hospital. And then when I started inquiring from the female health workers who I worked with, about 50 of them, I learned that there were health workers there who had proxidentia. Proxidentia is a condition in which the ut uterus has been prolapsed and is actually hanging out. And they were sort of going through life without with that, we were talking of getting uh, you know, safe motherhood out into the community, but they hadn't felt confident to share their own problems. So I started understanding that, hey, women's health actually is a lot beyond what I have learned in the textbook. There were these social cultural conditions which governed women's health and their ability to sort of do something that I was trying to promote as good health practice. And they wouldn't even share because you know there were things that they felt could not be shared with a male. But at the same time, I realized that within that community, there were these older women, guys, many of them, who were not only sort of eager to help other women, but they were also very uh, eager to help me to learn these new realities. And they had full of, they were full of, you know, jokes, they were full of fun, they used to tease me, etc. So this was one kind of experience that I got about rural reality. The other set of experiences that I had was the experience of public systems. And one of the first public systems that we encountered was around the birth of our daughter. Uh, I was a doctor running a community health project. So the plan was that our daughter would be born at home. And I had trained midwives at that point. We had two trained midwives from England who were supporting our program. So it was supposed to be a great uh, place to have a childbirth in which uh, women could have control. And the medical support was as and when required. But what we found is that for some reason we had to go to the hospital. But when we went to the hospital, the fact that I was a doctor, the fact that I knew all those people before, the fact that we had already connected with the hospital for emergency obstetric care made no sense. My medical opinion, my clinical opinion made no sense. And they were taking judgments, which to me clearly was not the proper judgment. And of course, we went with an obstetric condition. So our obstetric uh, sort of history that we came with, the kind of sort of data had come, which was not respected. And it went into a serious problem there. Thankfully, the consequences have not been disastrous. They've been reasonably good. Then a few years later, we had this experience where me, my colleagues, and a host of uh, my uh, sort of colleagues, we were jailed because we had published a study in Hindi around risks and vulnerability to HIV and HIV being a sexually transmitted disease. It was about sex and sexuality. And we realized that conversation about sex and sexuality had touched a very, very raw nerve, not in the communities that we worked, but in among the guardians of society, the political guardians, the social guardians of society. That was another reality. And the final reality, which sort of uh, in many ways sort of contributes and closes this circle was the experience of this young girl called Rani Jaiswal. We came across Rani Jaiswal's story 
in a newspaper about this 13 year old girl who had been sterilized as a 27 year old woman, mother of three children. We conducted a fact finding and we realized that the public system was under such intense pressure to fulfill targets of family planning. And this was 2001 that it was playing havoc with the lives of people. And because there were targets, people in positions of power were taking other people who were subordinate to them, who were you know, in some way in a feudal relationship and trying to get them sterilized to perform their, uh, to uh, obtain their targets. And this was, mind you, after the target free approach had been announced in the country. So these were certain foundational experiences, which sort of gave me an insight into how people lived their lives and how public systems viewed people. So what I want to do here is I have a short two minute clip that I want to share with you. What I would like you to do is see this two minute clip and then tell me what do you think is wrong in this situation? I'm going to change the uh, video sort of, oops, I'm going to change the, Presentation, so give me a minute. Is, is it working, Abhijit? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear my... Can you no, see anything? No, we can't see anything. You can't see perhaps, anything? No, no. We're not able to see anything. Let me go back. Um, perhaps you I'm missed sure. us in the share oh, video. I have done share audio and I was sharing my entire screen. Oh, perhaps you can try it again. Yeah, I'll do that. Or let me uh, now send you the, uh, let me do the, the, I've got the file. So let me um, share the file. I'm sorry about this, everybody. We are all learning. Nice. 
अपने घर से साबुन अपने घर से तेल अपने घर से पत्ती अपने घर से लटेन अपने लेके घर पर आती है कभी कभी आती है लगभग तीन साल एम्बुलेंस हमारा जो है लगभग तीन साल से खराब मैं कह रहा बिना पैसे जांच हो रहा है तो क्या है या परेशान हो रहा है क्या ये हैं बिना पैसा जांच हो रहा है कौन दिक्कत है बिना पैसे की जांच करा रहा हूँ फिर भी समझ नहीं आ रहा नहीं दबा दीजिए क्या जनता है यार सुविधा क्या है मन की सभी दवा लिख देते हैं बाहर से जो जैसे दर्द ज्यादा हो जाता है सुई लिख देते हैं टीका सब लिख देते हैं क्या तो 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 एक बच्चा खास कर डॉक्टर लोग लेते हैं जैसे कि जो सिस्टर होते हैं क्लास बच्चा कराए तो चार सौ रुपया भाई अपन मेहनत मजदूरी अपन ले लेते हैं चार सौ यहाँ आने वाला गरीब ही तो आता है क्या सारे अमीर लोग यहीं आएंगे जब गरीबों के लिए खोला गया हॉस्पिटल तो कम से कम उनमें हर सुविधा मिलनी चाहिए कि नहीं मिलनी चाहिए आशा है एलम है या फिर जो अस्पताल के डॉक्टर हैं इसमें से कभी किसी ने आपसे आके बात की क्या क्या सुविधा है लेकिन दीदी अस्पताल में गरीबन का बस एक ही ऊपर ही ऊपर से ढांचा बना गया था कि गरीब को वहाँ पर सेवा so that's the film i'll come back to the presentation and i have a question my question is what do we see as being what is wrong So what is wrong? What we saw, I hope this time it was visible. What did you think was going wrong? Can I have responses? Can we uh, can we do some responses here? I'm not familiar with this platform, but is it possible for me to get feedback? so uh, is it possible to uh, get some feedback from the people on in the colloquium or what did think was wrong okay uh, it may be difficult so uh, any a uh, way you can comment in the comment or uh, chat box so let's go ahead then i'll, I'll go back to the presentation I'm sure you have been writing down in your uh, sort of notebook which you may have next to you about what you think was wrong in that presentation. Um, what I have seen as being some of the challenges in public health in India are that at one end the public system often thinks that people are the problem. People have a whole set of unhealthy behaviors. and the goal of the system is to get people to adopt what they feel are healthy behaviors healthy behaviors could be preventive healthy behaviors could be curative healthy behaviors and that becomes a slow process so what we have because of that is lofty goals but extremely slow progress and there is a satisfaction that we are moving ahead even though there is very very slow progress and incremental process sometimes and we are happy with that incremental approach however what happens because of this is often times we miss out the reality of the poorest and the most marginalized we miss out that is ignored and we are trying to shoehorn them into the appropriate set of healthy behaviors that I, that we think as the public policy managers that is appropriate for better health at the same time in the name of quality we are trying to deliver the same package of technically defined services across the country 
And uh, because we are looking and we are satisfied with the incremental approach, and as the indicators, the large indicators move slowly ahead, there is very little attention to the consequences of failure in the lives of the most marginalized. So uh, because there is a movement at the district level, there is a movement at the aggregate movement at the level of the country, there's a sense of uh, satisfaction that we are moving. Yes, it's a large country. Yes, it's a diverse country. Yes, it's a country with very poor socioeconomic indicators. So obviously progress is going to be slow, but it is moving ahead in the right direction. And because we do not think that the reality of the lives of the poor really matter at the individual level, overall, because also of the strict caste class hierarchies, accountability, especially to the poor who are the largest users of public systems, is simply not there. Let me try to open these in a little deeper way. So let's look at what we think about people. We think that we have to get people to adopt healthy behaviors. But today, what they have is a whole long list of unhealthy behaviors. And I, I may be taking too many examples from maternal health and family planning, but that's primarily because those have been the two areas I have worked the most. So in terms of uh, the, the, the domain of maternal health and family planning, it's always they get married too early, they have too many children, they don't use contraceptives, they don't go to hospitals for medical care, they go to the informal providers, they go to dyes, they go to quacks, they go to, and of course they're dirty, they don't wash hands, they squat, they, you know, they do open defecation, they're, so, so the whole set of, and then even when we give them medicines, they don't take the medicine. So this is the sort of dirty, uh, completely sort of whole set of wrong health behaviors. How do we get them to act and behave in what we think is the model health behavior? And I want you to hold that idea of the model. Whose imagination does this model step from? The step uh, come from? We have to think about it. And then this lofty goals business. These are some of the indicators for NRHM. NRHM started in 2005, was supposed to be over by 2012. And these were the so-called, and I take the example of NRHM because NRHM in many ways, ways sort of gave a tremendous uh, boost to the public health system. The public health system has performed the best since NRHM. But if we look at the progress, we find that IMR 30 per thousand was the goal in 2012. In 2018, we still haven't reached 30 per thousand. Maternal mortality was supposed to come down to 100 per 100,000 right births. In 2018, we still don't have that number. Uh, total fertility rate was supposed to come to 2.1. And this is, of course, it has been supposed to have been there since 2000. We still haven't come there. Tuberculosis dots has been going on for quite some time now. And we were supposed to maintain a 85% cure rate but we still have two and a half million new cases coming up each year. So the infection is still spreading quite extensively in this country. Now let's come to the second issue, the issue of the most marginalized, whose reality we often sort of completely fail to comprehend. These are two pictures from an area called uh, Kalyan Singhpur block in Raigada district in Odisha. In this these are uh, tribal women from a tribe called the Kondhas. They are the Plains Kondhas. Now, these Kondhas are forest dwellers. Kondhas do not have literacy. Kondhas don't even speak Uriya. 56% of uh, Raigada is tribal. But what do we find? Do we understand their reality? In no way. All the ANMs do not, ANMs and Ashas are not Kondhas. They are all our health education takes place in Uriya language. This is a study we did about four years ago. There was no understanding how cones were looking at childbirth. There was no understanding how cones lived their life of childhood care, childbirth care, how cones thought risks happened during pregnancy, and they did have risks. They were only seen as a set of people who did not have the desirable behaviors, and how could we? get them into institutional delivery? How could we get them to have skilled attendance at birth? And what we find is there was this effort to also have halfway houses. There's a picture on the top right is a halfway house. 
they put a tv in that half way house now this was talking about old women who don't have a roof on top of their head they do not know what is a tv so in this particular dormitory these women felt like they were in cages if you look at the woman on the left with that baby they live in a set of uh, bamboos or set of an attach without walls and we were putting them into a room with four walls a roof and a door with a lock they were feeling uh, entrapped they were feeling imprisoned they ran away they were given milk what you see on the left is a bottle is a bowl of milk they don't drink milk so there was no attempt to understand how these people live their lives and we were trying to get them into institutional delivery we were trying to get them into referral transport in a place where the only place way which women are transported is what you see there a woman in a blanket carried on the shoulders on a bamboo do we think this range of services which is appropriate for many places across the country will work in the lives of people like the cones and there are many areas across the country which similar diversity means similar different realities have we thought of them when we are doing our planning now let's to move to the consequences of failure to deliver quality services and this is a extreme example but i wanted to take this extreme example up because it shows you what happens sterilization in this country has had a very bad and checkered history uh, most of you must have been too young to remember that once upon a time the indian public health system was a sterilization services only system we ran our entire country through an arrangement where targets for family planning targets for female sterilization and later on for some time targets for male sterilization was the basis for determining the performance of all rural functionaries and all rural programs there was a lot of pressure that was stopped target free approach started we, there was a pressure to do quality of services standards were set up people went to court we were part of the group that went to court to ensure that quality of services were uh, you know were being complied with and here in 2014 we have a situation where in one camp finally 15 women died because no quality standards were maintained we are not the quality standards clearly say you can one doctor cannot do more than one team cannot do more than 20 operations in 2 hours here was 80 surgeries in 5 hours the quality of the medicines was not checked women died because women died there was some pressure because so many women died but often failures are india has no record of how many operations fail and we do 3 to 4 million operations a year so we don't know how many fa failures take place consequences of failure is a new child consequences of failure could also be a maternal death we have found that so there is absolutely no interest in understanding we are happy that our number of sterilization services are up to the mark that is enough for the health system to be happy this brings us directly to the issue of accountability who is responsible if systems don't happen in the last 15 years since nrhm as many of you know we have been pushing institutional delivery so that emergency obstetric care is available to all the women who require it this is part of a study we did a few years ago uh, i talked to odisha i talked of uh, up in the film now i want to talk a little bit of malda district in west bengal we were doing a set of Uh, maternal death reviews and what we found in malda district the eight maternal deaths that took place that we were investigating seven had reached a district hospital or a medical college so they had reached a tertiary care hospital but once they reached the tertiary care hospital a whole new set of problems began there were delays in treatment beginning they had reached there after three stops they have reached there after it has been decided that it's a life threatening emergency but it takes them 2 hours to set the system of care in place and 2 hours is enough to kill the woman so obviously this woman died we know what we found is that while drips were put in but important things like medicines blood 
investigations were not provided on the spot. The family was asked to arrange for blood. Here was a family which was coming from rural Malda. They didn't know where blood was available. The hospital didn't have blood available. So delay in starting treatment, delay in getting blood, which is the most important of, uh, uh, material for emergency obstetric care is not available even when we have invited millions of women, 25 million women to come to hospitals to deliver. We have given them the invitation, but we don't have the arrangements. This is like having a marriage party, sending your invitation out and not arranging for the food. We will never do it. But because these are poor people, because these are rural people, we are happy with incremental support. We are not at all worried about what is happening to the gaps. When there is a gap, people die. And just to let you know, Malda is a Muslim majority district of West Bengal. So what we find is there is a clubbing of this kind of lack of accountability also where people come from marginalized communities. Of course, services are supposed to be free. And in this particular case, people who actually reached the hospital for care had to spend a lot of money even for staying for a brief period because before they were provided a referral 1500 for the brief stopover before a referral these are about three four years ago so what are the key challenges in this kind of a situation just analysis is not enough we have to find a solution and i want to propose some solutions and that solution is how do we understand the reality of marginalized people's lives and when i say marginalized people in, in this country, a fourth of the entire population can be considered marginal. So it is not a tiny population. How do we design appropriate interventions for marginalized people in this diverse country? And then how do we know these are working? So here I want to introduce you to the concept of health equity. Doctors often say, give us evidence. So one of the things for a public health professional is to understand how do we understand existing data to identify inequities? How do we identify the differences between people's lives? And the important thing around equity is are these differences avoidable? And are these differences unjust? Because if they are avoidable and unjust, they should not happen. We should be responsible that they are not happening. So they can be avoided and we should be careful that this injustice ends. So this inequity actually is directly related to the ability not only to enjoy services, but also in terms of whether they live their life free of morbidity, whether they are able to survive childbirth, whether their mortality rates are higher or lower. And so these have tremendous consequences in terms of the healthiness and the well-being of people. And what is happening over time is that there's a consensus that these are unacceptable and we have to find remedies to change these inequities. So for us as public health professionals or for us as development professionals, the equity angle gives us an imperative to look at problems differently, to look at and design appropriate solutions. And this broadly, as I say, can be linked to the human rights approach. So what then is a human rights approach? Uh, as many of you uh, may know, the right to health is among the uh, human rights which were laid down by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The right to health is directly not implied in the, not written down in the Indian constitution, but it has been read in terms of Supreme Court judgments. I want, don't want to go there. Uh, that's more into the legal domain. But in terms of definition, what the WHO says is the right to health means the right to the highest attainable standard of health. What does that mean in operational terms? Because an highest, uh, highest attainable standard of health has to be translated into operational principles. So the rights principles is respect means that the right to health has to be acknowledged in documents, in laws, in policies, and schemes. There have to be arrangements to fulfill them and to ensure that protection of this right is happening through any violation that takes place is detected and redressed. So non-discrimination 
and protection is extremely important to fulfill the right to health. So what does that mean in terms of services? The services have to be timely, they have to be affordable, they have to be appropriate quality, but they also have to be acceptable to people. We cannot put people into our mold. We have to understand what is people's lives and try to tailor our services to meet people's realities. The other way around that we try to do in India does not mean that we are following the acceptability principle. And then just healthcare services are not enough. We have to look at the underlying determinants, which include water, food, sanitation, etc. But I want to open that up to understand social determinants later. When we deliver services, we try to look at a rights based approach. So there's a state obligation to respect, protect and fulfill. And this happens through a series of functionaries who are duty bearers and the people become the active rights holders. And their participation within the entire process is extremely important. And that feedback happens through planning and accountability. So that's the operational mechanism to ensure that the rights to health approach is being implemented. So first, how do we identify iniquity? One of the ways to do it is to understand disaggregated data. What I've done here is try to present to you the NFHS4 data on infant mortality across different states. So one layer of analysis is different states. But within the different states, the average state IMR or the average state data actually hides a lot of diversity. So first and foremost, look at Assam. If the state level IMR is 47, the urban IMR is already 28. So the difference between the average and the urban is huge. Now let's move to mothers. Where the mothers haven't gone to school, it is nearly 60. And where mothers have had 10 years of schooling, it is less than half, it is 26. If you look to marginalized communities like scheduled castes, it's Dalit, it's 41. With scheduled tribes, it's also 41. With Muslims, which is slightly lower than the state average, but with Muslims, it's slightly higher. If we look across to uh, another state like Maharashtra, we find a similar diversity. Whenever there's urban, it's lower. Whenever, most cases, whenever SC or ST, it's higher. So this is in terms of outcomes, infant mortality rate. So we can see very clearly the people with higher privilege have lower infant mortality rates and people with less privilege who have some kind of marginalization have much poorer health outcomes. But let's move one step further into the program and see in terms of how is the service delivery happening to these communities. Same states, same issue of child health and we look at non-vaccination. Not vaccination, but who is getting left out. So if we look at districts, the overall district coverage is 13.8 are being left out for vaccination in the children with the age group 20 to 23. But if you look at the highest district, all children are covered. So the most uh, sort of advanced district, no child is missed. But if you look at the district with the lowest, we find a third of the child children are left behind. If you look at UP, 50% of the children are left behind they're not being vaccinated. Whereas in the highest district, every child is being covered. So it's a huge range from zero to 50%. Now, if we look at socially marginalized communities, we find that systematically in many socially marginalized communities, the, 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 the range is different for different states, but there is a huge difference. I will leave you two minutes with this slide to look at the diversity and the difference across different groups in terms of non-vaccination among children. Some people are being left out. Some people are getting missed. Some people don't receive the services. It's probably those children who also die at a higher rate. Why don't they receive services? Is it because they are backward, they don't come, or is it there any other reason behind it? 
let's move ahead. So how do we understand inequity? The first is to understand or open up equality. We have a constitutional protection of equality. But does that mean everybody has access to that protection? Does that mean everybody understands and aspires to it? Does that mean everybody has an equal amount of self-concept and self-determination? What does our history say? Our history says that we are a very, very hierarchical society. Within those hierarchical societies, some people benefit by keeping other people socially subordinate. It's called oppression. Just because we have a legal definition of equality, just because we have it in the constitution, does it mean equality is an operational principle which is transacted through every relationship or every human interaction? And I'll leave you with that thought because I think that's something that we have to understand when the provider and the patient relationship is taking place, community and health provider relationship is taking place. Is it taking place through the prism of equality? Does it happen through the prism of respect? Then I want you to understand the difference between marginalization and exclusion. Marginalization usually means further away from the center. People who are living further away, they could be economically, they could be geographically, they could be physically. But then there is the issue of exclusion. People who are close to the center but do not exist within our imagination because they do not count as people who are important in our worldview. And in a world or in an India in which social hierarchies are so prevalent, it could be caste, it could be religion, it could be gender, exclusion. Di the discrimination and stigma follow each other. And I want to talk a little bit about the stigma later on. Then is the question is, if we do not realize this, how will we disaggregate the data? First is to understand that our society is fragmented, our society is very diverse, and then we can look at what the data says. The data can be quantitative data, as I uh, showed it to you a little while ago. It could also be, why do people behave the way that they do? Are people stupid? That is why they do this. Or do they have a different worldview? When we went to uh, the cones, we realized that the way they see life, they see health, they see childbirth is completely different from the way the health department looks at childbirth. Childbirth is seen as a biomechanical process with certain problems. Most people, including our families, look at childbirth as a cultural event. But we've never made an understand, never made an effort to understand how do they see childbirth. We've never made an effort to see how is menstruation seen as a polluting phenomenon. And we then are going into menstrual hygiene. We are talking of clean menstruation, but we are completely ignoring the fact that whenever most Indian women are menstruating, they are considered unclean, dirty and polluting. And that has nothing to do with whether we are using pads or not. We have never been able to tie the two together. In this country, the discipline of medical anthropology is a very, very new discipline. But that discipline needs to grow. I'll talk about it a little later. I want to bring you back to the issue of model behavior. What we do through our health programming is try to set up a desired behavior, which is the model of what should be done, whether it is mental, maternal health, family planning. I've seen this in these two programs very clearly. It could also be for tuberculosis control. You come when you have a cough, you get tested, you take your disease, you, uh, dis the medicine, you take it uh, daily. There's somebody coming to your doorstep to give it to you, doesn't think whether that's a migrant worker, doesn't think whether it's an informal laborer with great economic sort of insecurity, doesn't think whether that person is living uh, in, a, in a shanty somewhere outside an industrial town. Those things have not been thought of. So the thing that happens is whenever you see something which is not according to the model behavior, there is a loop of stigma and coercion. And the stigma and coercion we also found during COVID. So whenever people are doing something, behaving in a way which is their life and their interpretation of how they live their lives, the police comes with a danda. This happened during COVID. So 
people were running scared they were locked they weren't given assurance the public system never believes in trusting people to behave in their best interest and supporting them to behave in their best interest it thinks people are being deviant to the imagined behavior that the public system has created through their own middle class understanding middle class urban understanding and this is something that i want to put put up front therefore we have to also see how we work in rural communities among poor communities from the, our own historical social cultural background because we often carry those sort of um, internalized in our own heads and in our own expectations and this is something that i have seen consistently in the way the public system deals with people another thing that we need to understand and this is drawing upon this kind of understanding is the social determinants of health framework i'm going to put these ideas in front of you and i hope you go back to more literature the social economic uh, social uh, social determinants of health framework actually says the ability to enjoy health and well being depends on a set of you know layers of factors there's the structural determinants there are political determinants but there is also the issue of social class ethnicity racism etc and there is a space where you can create social capital and there is a space where you can create social discrimination and these things actually can work in the interests of the poor if there is solidarity and the other thing is these work in interrelated ways so if we understand the interrelationships and we understand where we can leverage the change we can create the change in a more meaningful way people's lives have to be understood through their own realities we cannot force our realities we have to understand their behaviors we have to understand their psychosocial factors and some of it will be negative will not harm or will not help but how do we build upon that we cannot tell them what you are doing is wrong what you are doing is not modern which is not culturally appropriate because then what we are doing is we are trying to force our way of thinking on people's lives and people will resist marginalized people are also frightened people so in terms of academics what does it mean we are in a university what it means that health is not only the biomedical approach the column on the left if you look at the column on the left that's what what is taught in the medical college some of the topics are not taught that well but on the left is medicine and public health but on the right is a whole range of associated disciplines that we have to bring in to our understanding of how people live their lives which impact their health and the way services can be del delivered so this is a integrated conceptual framework which draws upon various disciplines and i'm so happy to see an institution like apu actually making this effort to draw these things in because people's lives are not isolated and it cannot be you know while the medical people look for solutions within the body health actually is the body living in an ecosystem and if we have to talk of that ecosystem we have to understand the ecosystem we cannot shoehorn the body and the person to behave in the way we feel our ecosystem works so how do we then design appropriate interventions how do we get communities to take charge of this kind of intervention in which they are the beneficiaries but they are also the principal actors so first is this is a drawing upon what is called the realist approach to evaluation which first says that the social system is a complex system and social change has to happen in that complex system but it since it's populated by living beings it is constantly adapting so it's open adaptive complex this gives us opportunities this gives us spaces in which self learning can take place to take the process forward but to do that we need to understand how existing relationships in the community work we cannot think of straight line relationships it's not like growing uh, rice or wheat put water put khad into the sand or into the soil do a soil test and then your growth will happen it's much more complex so relationships have to be understood and those relationships help us to build what is called the 
context mechanism outcome hypothesis. So how does this kind of intervention work in this kind of context to provide this kind of outcome? So this is something which uh, we have done. Uh, I don't want to explain that too much. This is the subject of another talk. But this allows us to put people in the driver's seat because we are trying to include them within the equation as active agents. And it's not designed by us. It's a, co it's a collaborative design of people trying to become, understand their own reality, take steps which are appropriate for their lives for an outcome that they have an investment in. It is not an outcome which the government wants to show as an indicator. It's an outcome that people want to have in their lives. So how then do we develop interventions in real terms using this right to health approach from realist to right to health? So on one side is the availability and access, and I've marked it in green. Is These are things that we are thinking about today. Where are the service delivery points? Are the personnel adequate? Is the supplies adequate? How do we talk of delays? But then the issue of quality is only assurance and standards. We are doing very little to ensure that the attitude of providers, the issue of accountability, the issue of cultural competence is being dealt with. The acceptability part is completely being left out. So if you look at the three boxes of access, quality, and acceptability, most of the interventions today are in the availability and access box, a little in the quality box, and nothing in the acceptability box. And in a country which is so diverse, in a country which is so culturally imbued, every few kilometers we may have cultural diversity, we have very little understanding of the culture which informs people's lives and behaviors. Having said that, I want to just give a list of some interventions that we have done. I have been personally involved in, of course, uh, and in different roles. Many roles were being uh, were read out by Srilata at the beginning. So this is a set of interventions that I've been personally involved in, appropriate standards and guidelines, training of providers on what, what are called soft issues. A participatory planning with uh, people and training of district managers, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, learning among civil society actors, uh, community-driven accountability mechanisms, community-driven advocacy, interventions in the National Human Rights Commission. I, as I today, I'm also a member of their health advisory group, and of course, using the courts for creating checks and balances and new standards. Thank you. If you have questions, I'd love to have those now. Over to you, Shilata. Thank you so much, Abhijit. Uh, excellent, uh, very, very uh, wide ranging talk. Uh, I think that was uh, really uh, for all of us. Uh, thank you for sharing your experience with us. That made it much more uh, lively and real, actually. Uh, I'm going to ask my own questions first, giving a chance to people to put their questions in the comment box. Uh, I request all those who are listening to this talk to please enter your comment, uh, your questions in the live chat box because uh, uh, it's not possible to have a direct uh, interaction with your people. Uh, but let me start and uh, while. Uh, we are interacting with the others when uh, we add your questions. One of the things that I did, and um, uh, you know, I was uh, sort of uh, taken by that when you said that uh, uh, you know we have very lost people and uh, the goals are set by a certain people and they are meant to be fulfilled and that we're making a lot of incremental progress and we're happy with having made incremental progress but um, you know now the uh, NFA data has come out and uh, actually in any program and in many areas we have gone in the wrong direction so we are faced with this uh, situation where even that incremental uh, is not taking place, you know, so we can't even have the comfort of that. Um, what would you say uh, you know, are the first two or three urgent things that we need to take care of? Uh, and that's my first question, actually. 
Okay. Um, so we'll do one question at a time. Is that okay? I'm waiting for uh, participants to post their questions. I'm not seeing any yet. I'm not sure why. I hope this so. Is yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Lata, for that. Uh, first of all, is the issue of trajectory of change. Uh, you know, theoretically, as as academics in the public um, development discipline, and where we are talking about social change, um, what do we have as our own hypothesis about the trajectory of change? I gave the example of agriculture because drugs and you know a lot of our research comes from the drug paradigm especially the randomized control trial paradigm. And there we have something called the dose response mechanism. So we try to find out minimum effective dose, median effective dose, median lethal dose to understand how much, what is effectiveness, how much it will work, etc., etc. At what level does it become toxic? But then, and, and we do dose response curves. In social work, we have kind of imbued the same theory that if you can model get it into a modeling straight line it will work uh, if it is a curve like this so, so there, there's a predictability there's a and we're drawing it from different disciplines the question is in social change where there you know there are these uh, human factors which are involved the nature of predictability has to be hypothesized so for example if you live with somebody and you sleep in the same bed, will you wake up with the same response to the person, even if both of you have been sleeping for eight hours? Doesn't happen. But if you put hydrogen and oxygen together, they can only react in two ways. So there is a level of unpredictability because it's a complex system. So first is to understand complex systems and to understand within those complex systems, change is happening all the time. Change is the only constant. The question is, what is the direction of change? What is the motivation of change? What are the benefits and costs of change that different people have? We want to change that basically cost and benefit of change for the people who have usually not benefited and given a lot of cost. But there are also people who are also very frightened of change because they have very little autonomy. So if we are looking at that kind of a situation, then change may take place differently. I have tried to understand change in the gender paradigm. Um, so I can give you an example. What we have found is when you come with a new intervention, there is a novelty or a honeymoon period. And the community, especially we use gatekeepers approach, then there is a welcome and the Outcomes that you want, the first level outcomes are easy to get. But when you come to issues where social structures are being challenged, even in the healthcare, if you challenge social structures, there will be pushback. The fact that things are not changing doesn't mean there is no ferment. So you have to also interpret no change. So interpretation, interpretation of no change, maybe it's not stuck because there is no progress, but it is stuck because there is a contest. It is a potential hill. And for changing that potential hill, what is the next level of intervention that is required? Doing the same thing that you did in the past when you were in the novelty phase, is that going to be enough? Is the input, does the input require to change? So that's something that we need to understand. Now I want to come to the health. If you compare maternal and child health interventions in India, Bangladesh and Nepal, India has done better than, uh, sorry, Bangladesh and Nepal have done better in the last 20 years, without a doubt. They have become better. Their indicators have become better than India and uh, than India. Bangladesh and Nepal at far lower GDP, at far lower technical competence. How is that possible? So something has happened where technical excellence, best public health knowledge, international expertise, the best colleges are not helping. So there's something that is happening in which the community and the provider system has a better relationship with a lower level of technical know-how available with a lower level of overall investment in health available. I will leave you with that provocation. Okay. 
I, I won't respond to that right now because we have a couple of questions. Uh, Praveen, can you question here? Someone is asking and asking, I think Certainly. I think the first is, of course, Sri Lanka. Uh, Sri Lanka has a health system which is completely different from India, but uh, it's also under stress. So I think Sri Lanka controlled its maternal mortality long, long ago. We don't need to go to South Asia. We need to look. We can look inside. We can look at uh, Kerala, how Kerala organizes itself. And as I said, look at um, Nepal, look at Bangladesh, completely different kinds. So Bangladesh Muslims are the breeders, the irresponsible breeders, according to India. They've controlled their fertility rates tremendously. Uh, they, uh, look at uh, uh, Nepal, completely isolated. No medical colleges. Indians are going and setting up medical colleges there. They have been able to control their maternal mortality with far less availability of gynecologists and obstetricians. So my question here is probably we need to find different systems. We need to find ways in which people also define their own solutions. We cannot have the solutions defined from, uh, I won't name names. Uh, just to uh, kind of add <clears throat> add uh, to that uh, question I, and you know take this discussion a little further isn't it also true that india is not i mean it is not homogeneous at all right there are many places in india that are doing better than bangladesh and nepal let's say and there are many places that are doing much worse so what you said that you know we can learn from within our own country i think that's that's very very true, but uh, you know when you look at the, uh, these regional differences, why is it? Would you say that we don't learn more uh, from each other without even looking beyond our border? See, uh, I've been in public policy for twenty years now. What I have learned is, Indian public system does not respect Indian public Indian expertise, especially homegrown expertise. If I had an international university funding my work, there would be acceptance. Today, we are only looking for international acceptance. Uh, it is extremely perverse. 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when NRHM came out, and NRHM is unique in that way. NRHM was designed by Indian experts with field experience. Whole range of us, people like me, with 15, 20, 25 years of field experience of lived reality of living in rural communities came together to design NRHM. At that point, we had access to ministry, we had access to Nirman Bhavan, we had access to states, and we had conversations, and we did none of us took money. That's extremely important to the government of India is extremely reluctant to pay money for advice. Today, what has happened, these experts are being hired from international who are whose paymasters are international agencies. Huge international sort of agency supported units are sitting next to the chief minister's office in many states. And they are private enterprises. So the person sitting is often an IAS driven by a school of public health from the US or England. So just look around and see how many technical agencies have become popular in India. Who pays for them? The government of India is not paying. They have easy access to, so the government of India is getting free expertise. It's free for them because somebody else is paying. When we were free, we were volunteering. None of us took grants from anywhere to pay. Today, that has collapsed in 10 years. And that was perhaps a honeymoon period of four to five years when this happened. And it was then systematically undermined. I don't know if whether this is the answer to your question, but we have to respect local expertise. I have, I remember I was part of the health steering committee for the 12th family, uh, 12th uh, final, uh, you know, planning commission, uh, 12th five year plan. And one of the things that we suggested is that why can't, you know, we have the international global challenge fund to do solutions in Indian reality. Why can't we set it up from the ministry? Why can't we promote Indian practitioners, Indian universities to work together to find locally relevant solutions. 
why does it have to be university of that dash 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 in that country which finds an international partner which hires indians to do it because the solutions have to be very very local and then what are the parameters universities today are being pressured to follow international donor parameters the international donors are deciding what is the best solution because the mdg and the sdg has said this is going to happen but they have no theory of change the theory of change has to happen local we still very simple example in india before we stopped uh, tba training and tbas were delegitimized overnight we had these disposable delivery kits i was working in rural uttar pradesh and rural um, uttarakhand and i realized that cutting the cord with a blade is extremely difficult blade is very uh, the cord is very slippery and couldn't do it we as doctors were using you know look at a, a scissor it has uh, support at the bottom it has support at the top and you cut it like this but you take a blade on a slippery thing you can't do it you can't put your hand behind it you'll cut it what i realized the dyes were using sikka in uttarakhand so i said boil the sikka i looked at the, i found a nepal kit had actually sterilized pieces of wood we haven't done it in india because nobody went and studied how childbirth is taking place childbirth is a caste tradition we haven't studied that that childbirth is polluted so uh, you know i know there are medical anthropologists in your discipline but the discipline of medical anthropology is hardly there in indian formal universities so if we are going to help indian community especially rural marginalized communities to take care of their health we have to understand how they are taking care of their health today today they are not making an active effort to stay unhealthy they are taking an active effort to stay healthy the only thing is they are doing it according to according to principles which we disagree with for which they have belief systems we have evidence but we have to match our evidence to their belief systems and it can be done they often have you know I, i when i started working with belief systems i used a simple three helpful harmful harmless if it is harmful then let's have a conversation if it is harmless or if it is helpful then we have to promote it they have to also get a faith in their own behaviors in their own beliefs we can't shatter their belief system to create a new one they already shattered people thank you uh, can we have the next question uh, praveen how can we program or focus more on quality and acceptability in these processes well i've already talked about something around quality uh, is uh, qual- uh, sorry on acceptability acceptability is to also understand what is people's lives like so there in very strong call for medical anthropology very strong call for social uh, i hate to call it science you know sometimes the social the moment you call it social science you're trying to copy medicines or when a copy methodology comes from physics please don't do it uh, let's try to use qualitative methods let's try to understand people's you know beliefs uh, world views and as i was talking about in the odisha case people do have a fear of childbirth but we didn't try to understand what is their fear of childbirth what we did is try to prove to them that uh, anemia is bad and they don't know what is anemia so instead of building upon their fears building upon their concerns building upon what they see as good we completely try to force a totally different alien system into those people and and this is not just because they are cones extremely they are not primitive at that particular group but this is even for you know people like uh, middle class bengalis are doing things quietly on their own which the government doesn't know we all live our lives full of our own belief systems which are probably not according to the uh, you know the rule laid down by who and the nohf we do it because we know we can subvert it but when it comes to the poor we try to force it into their lives why do they use quacks because there's nobody else uh, available there that i've done studies in quality of care and i've realized that the people's first concern is relief you know when i was a doctor i used to hate giving people injections because i had the rational therapy but people 
associate uh, injection with relief people associate the quack with somebody who will talk to them politely will not be disrespectful gali nahi dega paise nahi mangega jab paise nahi hai so if you are going to talk quality you have to also understand what the quality expectations are quality is not just parameters which are laid down by sort of technical it is also expectations we have to build upon those expectations we have to build people's own sense of esteem that they can expect they can aspire and that is where we have worked on in our accountability framework is that accountability starts from the from the self belief that i deserve so these are little practical things cannot be done with the help by the provider today as they are trained so we need a whole set of mobilizers to work with the health system what what can be called the you know what we have in the technical um, sort of not in india the medical social worker there is a role for the medical social work business even in community health and that's where uh, a lot of civil society ngos can work during the nrhm period we did this community monitoring and one of the things that we said is the community monitoring has to happen outside the frame of the health department and i'm glad to say that in one state maharashtra 15 years later it still exists so it's possible in india to keep a system outside the health system which interacts with the health system on a respectful one on one basis thank you next question pravin thank you and is unrecognized and yes for the health we will see this well everybody has a health belief system not only tribal people you and i have health belief system our health belief system is that dawa khayenge to theek ho jayenge some of us feel that dahi should not be had in the morning some feel dahi should not be had had in your cold, having a cold you should not have this medicine in uh, this fruit in this uh, season that fruit in that season those are belief systems because if you go to the level of Uh, carbohydrate uh, protein and fat that is not what is uh, they will not allow, they will not determine it that way it comes from our own intrinsic understanding of bath bat pit and cough now bath pit and cough is belief system or is it evidence i leave it to you if you can prove bath chemically then do it uh, so the question is we all have in in these what i would call we are non modern cultures in, in 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 some ways even modern cultures have their belief systems we have intrinsic belief systems the question is some of us are unfortunate that their belief systems are considered harmful and then we add the superstition label without trying to understand why superstitions are also survival mechanisms when you have no other system to sort of help you negotiate life understand the unexplained in uh, the world you use superstition how many of us believe in god how many of us have evidence god exists a simple question to all of you if you have not seen god if you have not seen got a proof which is demonstrable then science wise there is no evidence but all of us believe in god god has become the reason why people are killing each other strong belief system so belief systems can be strong motivation the question is how do we look at somebody else's belief system do we respect it do we try to explain to them from to first we try to understand why they have that belief system and then try to align their belief system with being with well being because our desire is to reach well being predictably not to change the belief system necessarily then all of us will have to become atheists to start with. what is the mechanism to integrate wellness traditions and deliver to standard well, the, the standard way to deliver to standard is to create standards um, what does whenever we use a particular term what does it mean that is standards and uh, quality means how much of what when so the more we can set things up and this is like uh, dosage for drugs this much dose this many times a day in the morning or in the evening 
so the more we can build anything into that frame not everything is buildable into that frame but the more we can create interventions into that frame of what when how much and how to count it we can create standards and accountability happens when you count it and you find things are according to what you expected or there is a gap and then you try to fill the gap so that is accountability community in the accountability process is who is doing the counting who is doing the setting of the standard so there is a technical setting of the standard but there has to be a acceptability setting of the standard then there is a compliance to the standard in terms of delivery of a service and then there is the monitoring of that standard is it making sense sure So essentially, what you're saying is, in order to deliver something to standard, one has to first set those standards and achieve it. And uh, so, I, yeah. uh, the rest. The other question was, how do you integrate wellness traditions? Uh, you know, are wellness traditions even amenable to setting of these kinds of standards? I mean, because standards again. Uh, sort of implies uniformity, and I think what you're saying is that you can't have these uniform uh, sort of um, uh, expectations of uh, all the multiple wellness uh, traditions that we uh, have in uh, in India and elsewhere in the world as well. So, who is setting the standard for whom? Is my next question. The moment you try to set standards too far away from the people who have who are expected to comply with it. the more you are going to be in the tricky area of expert monitoring but if for example what do we mean by wellness if you know uh, when you come to the issue of health if i ask people down the street are you are you healthy most people will say yes but if we put 100% people into the who health criteria none of us are healthy okay there are so many parameters and then there is not only the absence of disease and infirmity but also so it's a very complicated one so question is what do we define as being healthy so i think that has to be negotiated in terms of a person's own understanding and what we know through science for example eating a particular kind of food predisposes you to a particular kind of disease for example people of my males of my age are either diabetic or atherosclerotic or hypertensive i am so uh, not diabetic so the question is if wellness means to keep this under control what does it mean it means disease uh, you have to take drugs on a regular basis but you also have to eat something which is tasty which you like and which you can afford and you have to do some exercises which you like so there is some compulsion that you have to do it so my desire for wealth wellness has to be inside it cannot be a prescription that somebody else does for me i have to seek it so i know my friends who know they are unhealthy and don't seek any care even though they are extremely well educated and they know that they are 25 kilos overweight and they won't move and there are other people who are you know running and healthy so everybody need not live up to 95 now the question is are you what are the consequences of ill health you will to manage it your family is willing to manage it and i'm taking an example away from the rural reality from my reality so it everything is not only rural poor or urban poor it is also us we don't live healthy lives look around the street how many doctors are smokers i think we have uh come to the end of our uh questions uh as well and also actually pretty much the end of our time uh abhijit so let me thank you uh for a wonderful uh, uh interaction and for a wonderful talk as well and um uh thanks very much i think we can close the session now thank you silata thank you colleagues at apu thank you all participants uh, it's unfortunate i didn't know who you are but wherever you are good luck and best uh, best wishes for your professional future and uh, surviving the difficult times that we are in thank you and bye bye oh uh, i'm sorry uh, uh, abhijit can i ask you one last question there is 
uh, some, uh, you know, there is one last question and uh, uh, I think maybe we should uh, try and answer it uh, because uh, this young woman has uh, sent this at the last minute, but let's try and see if we can. Yeah, how do you deal with inherent implementation challenges in the Indian health system? Grand question. <laughs> Who are you? Prime Minister, Health Minister? Because I think each question has to be understood in the way we can solve it. Because if we try to solve a problem which I have no influence over, then your solution is just a pipe dream. So if you are a medical officer, what do you do? If you are the DPMU, District Program Management Unit, uh, Program Manager, what do you do? It's going to be different from if you're the health secretary, if you're the health minister, or the prime minister, or in the PM. Because uh, the answer to that question is not one. And I definitely feel that each of us, if we can map the influence space that we have, and within that influence space where the health system operates, there will be solutions which are within our control, and there will be solutions outside our control. So things that are within our control, we can create definite plans and monitor. Things outside our control, we will have to find the next lever of influence to that space. And it could be either sort of, as we say, it could be vertical, it could be horizontal, it could be hybrid. Either So I'm not giving you a straight answer because a straight answer is there is no straight answer. You have to first locate yourself. For a person like me, I located myself outside the system, but trying to influence the system at different places. So there were times when I could influence the ministry at the highest level. At this point, I'm trying, my level of influence has become through the NHRC. So what we are trying to do is set uh, patient rights. So at the other end, because I'm a civil society worker, I also influence it at the level of the community. But I'm outside the health system, so I cannot have any influence on the way the service is delivered. I can have an influence through the way the community responds. I hope that answer uh, that uh, clarifies that answer in terms of the complexity. Yeah. Thank you, Abhijit. Now we definitely will end. <laughs> I won't call you back. <laughs> Thanks so Thank much. Thank you. Bye-bye.